Once again, I have the pleasure of bringing you guys a very, very interesting topic today about porn addiction. And I have with me today uh, a porn addiction expert, an author, and also he's part of recoveringpornaddict.com, Joshua Shea. Joshua, how are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Thank you for inviting me on the show today. I agree. Now, 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 Josh, you know, um, you know, I, you know, you have a book coming out, um, you're a recovering porn addict, but you know, where, where does this all start? Where, where does, uh, where, where, where do you say like, okay, this is happening to me? Well, um, I, my, my case for porn addiction is pretty much like anybody else's. Uh, once I got into recovery, uh, which is now about six years ago, I, uh, went back, did the hard work, and like most people who have porn addiction, you can uh, trace it to unresolved trauma uh, early in life. And that's true with almost all addiction. Because the fact with addiction is, addiction is usually never the main problem in somebody's life. Addictions develop because people are trying to run from that unresolved trauma, whatever caused it you know there was there was actually some trauma in your life that caused you to resort to porn as a gateway from from dealing with the the trauma that you had gone through what trauma was that well i was uh at the hands of a babysitter who i was with for about three years from around age four to seven Um, i stayed with her uh, when my parents went off to school to uh, teach, they're, they're both school teachers. So I stayed with her during the day. And then when I started going to school myself, I went there after school. Like I said, it was around three to six, four to seven. Uh, there was a fair amount of, uh, I wouldn't necessarily say sexual abuse, but sexual inappropriateness there. Um, big, bigger problems were the uh, mental abuse and a little bit of physical abuse that took place there. It was a very scary, scary place to be. And I had to really develop coping mechanisms and develop uh, survival skills that why they, while they may work for a six-year-old kid are not ones that work for an adult, yet I never really developed them because when I was 11, 12 years old, uh, for the first time ever, I was shown pornography by my older cousin. And I don't think it had to do with the naked people on the pages of those Penthouse or Hustler magazines. I don't think it was the sex. It was just there was something about what I saw that all of a sudden was like a light went on. It was like I knew even at you know 11 or 12 years old, I had just discovered something that was going to make my life better. I discovered something that was going to make it easier, that was going to take pain away. And about a year or two later, I actually had the exact same feeling. And this is the only time I've had this feeling a second time, the first time that I ever got drunk. And really, from the age of about 13, 14 years old, I battled both porn addiction and alcoholism. Um, Sometimes things were worse. Sometimes things were better, depending on what was going on in my life. Uh, But these were my two crutches to the point where I actually started to forget what happened back in that house when I was a little kid. And it wasn't until... Uh, I was going through the recovery process, or as it was right before I started to go through the recovery process, that some of the repressed memories started coming back, uh, and I was remembering what happened there. And then as I went into very intense therapy and to a couple of uh, different rehab centers, we worked on what those memories were. And once I started unlocking them, it all became very clear, you know, why things went the way that they did. And I'll tell you, I know that there are a lot of people who just try to white knuckle it, and try to stay away from their addictions, whether it's drugs or sex or gambling or whatever it is. But it's almost always dealing with some kind of trauma that happened in your life previously. And when I did the very hard work to get through that trauma, to look at it, to recognize how it uh, contributed to who I became as a person, 
it was actually a lot easier to quit porn and to quit alcohol than I anticipated uh, because I had figured out what the real problem was. The real problem was never the porn addiction. The real problem was never alcoholism. They were problems. They caused a lot of problems, but the, they were really just band-aids that I was trying to put across, you know, my soul of that broken little kid who, you know, needed to grow up mentally, grow up emotionally, because I got stunted at six, seven years old when all this bad stuff was going on around me. And I just kind of blocked it out and detached from it. Now, you know, you, 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 you know, you have this babysitter, you, you're, you're, what's, what exactly is happening sexually um, in this house that is causing you to react this way? There were, there were, two big incidents that I usually bring to people. And, and uh, this shows you kind of the difference of what happened. Uh, one of the incidents that I remember very strongly was when I was, you know, again, about five or five or six. Uh, and she called, she took care of three or four children. And she was taking care of a one or two year old girl at the time. And she was changing her in the uh, bathroom or one of the bedrooms, um, uh, her diaper. And she called me in there and uh, told me that, you know, to touch the girl's genitals so I could see exactly how boys and girls were different and how it felt different. Uh, that's the only time I remember doing that. Um, and I got very mixed messages as well. Like that was something that I kind of knew was wrong, but I did anyway because this woman scared me to death. She also had a daughter. Um, this daughter, I think, was 19, 20, 21 um, at the time. I know she was out of high school. Um, and um, I, I really liked this girl. She was very pretty. Um, and a five-year-old boy, I you know, already, already knew what a pretty girl was. Um, and she was fun to be around. She was far more fun than her mother. And I would hang out with her in her room sometimes. And there was a day where she had to be at her job. She was a manager at a department store at the mall. Um, she had to be at her job. Uh, so we stopped doing whatever we were doing. And she told me to turn around so she could change. Uh, the way where I was standing in her room, I could see, you know, looking at a mirror on her bureau towards her closet and I could see that she was changing and she kind of turned around and saw me looking in the mirror and she you know told me to go over to her and I thought she was going to get really angry at me because she seemed like she was and she asked had I ever seen a woman's breast before and I said no so she let the bra that she was wearing drop to her elbows um, so I had breasts right in my face you know for the first time ever and she asked if I'd ever touched any before and I said absolutely not and she asked if I wanted to touch them and I said yes and she let me touch them for probably one to two seconds it wasn't long but but that was the most sexually charged, exciting moment of my life. And there was such a charge behind it that I, for a very long time, I chased that sexual high, uh, you know, before I got married when I was in my late teens and early 20s. Um, and I could never get that, you know, feeling of euphoria or feeling of adrenaline ever back again. So I had these very different things happening in this, you know, sexually inappropriate house because those are both very inappropriate uh, situations. Like I said, I mean, I, I, I guess it is abuse uh, both ways. Uh, but the other thing that was so different was that my parents were very uh, strict devout Catholics. We didn't talk about sex. We didn't walk around the house in our underwear, much less even naked. Um, so I got the, I got messages. Uh, I got very mixed messages about sexuality, both at this babysitter's house and at home and at my house. And, you know, was it good? Was it bad? Did it matter? It was just a whole mess that a five-year-old kid couldn't navigate. Now, what do you think was the toughest memory that you had to recall during this recovery stage? Uh, it was actually a sexual shaming that happened to my brother who was two years younger than me. Um, he doesn't remember it happening, which I am thankful to God for. Um, but I remember having to be there and being forced to shame him along with one or two of the other kids. Um, 
and it was just I I mean it was it was traumatic to this day when I think back on it. Now, um, you spoke about uh, being married, right? So, um, yep. in, in what shape um, does the porn addiction um, affect your relationship um, with, with women? Uh, I don't think it really did for a very long time because the thing that people need to recognize about uh, porn addiction um, or even sex addiction is that it's not a about a lack of intimacy it's not about a lack of being able to have sex or or being able to you know have girlfriends or anything like that um, you're searching for something else with the addiction you're searching for a peace of mind you're searching for lack of anxiety you're searching uh to you know de-stress yourself so even when i was a porn addict and as i was from you know like i said age 11, probably up to about 37, um, I was still with multiple, you know, girls when I was uh, in my dating years. And when I was with my wife, you know, I didn't look at porn for the same reasons I had sex with her. So we had a very normal sex life. She was by no means uh, a prude to pornography, uh, but she had no idea how much I actually watched it. I'd been a porn addict for, you know, 20 years before, not 20 years, probably about 15 years before I met her. And so I knew how to hide it from people. I knew how to not be conspicuous. And when I needed it, it was there for me. And I utilized it for the reasons I needed it. And then when it came time for the physical, you know, intimacy, uh, the love making that you hopefully have with your partner, that was there. And I was fine with that. It, it never bled into that area, because they serve two completely different masters. Just because there's an orgasm at the end of it, or it involves naked people does not mean that it's meeting the same needs. Okay, now, now, so here's my thing. Was, was there any point where you preferred porn over having sex? Uh, probably, um, Towards the end, before I ended up having to go and get help, um, I, it was I used pornography as a means of control. Um, because when you think about it, you know, tonight if you go home and you put on Pornhub, if you want to watch two white women go at it, you can. They're not going to say no. You want to watch two Asian women go at it, you can. You want to watch three Asian women, two midgets, and a donkey, you can. None of them are going to say no. You can get whatever you want with pornography, any shape, any size, any color. You can get whatever you want, and nobody on the page and nobody on the screen is ever going to say no to you. And as a very little kid, one of my survival skills was to create the illusion of control in my life. And I think that's really what pornography played into was my need for control. So when things were going out of control in my life, when I was more stressed in certain times than others, those were the times that I would be using more pornography. Now, obviously, also when you're very stressed and anxiety ridden and you can't relax and you feel like you got the weight of the world on your shoulders, you know, settling in for, you know, a sexual experience, sometimes you can't get your mind in it. Sometimes you, it feels like too much work. Sometimes, you know, it's just not what you want at the time. So I could go and I could watch porn and that would meet more of the self-soothing needs that I wanted than any kind of pleasurable uh, reciprocal activity between my wife and I. Wow. Um, now, you know, as as someone as someone who who uses porn, right? Um, what's what's the what's the sign that tells you I need to go get help? You know, wh when did you decide that? You know, or if or if it was a decision, or was it forced upon you um, to say like, hey, listen, you know, I think I need to go get help. Well. Um First thing that you have to understand is that addiction is addiction is addiction is addiction. It doesn't matter whether it's porn or sex or gambling or drugs or food or whatever it is. While each of those addictions will manifest themselves in different ways and have obviously different side effects, uh, what's going on in your brain with the chemicals, with dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, uh, the, all of those little things in your pleasure centers, uh, everything is the same basically from addiction to addiction. And the definition of addiction is when you partake in a behavior or a substance uh, and cannot stop 
despite understanding the negative effects that the substance or behavior can have and the negative consequences that it can have on your life. Um, and, and you can make uh, promises to yourself, you can begin to seek help, but for some reason you can still not stay away from this behavior or substance. So that's really what addiction is. And on top of that, with addiction, what happens is, and I'm sure if uh, anybody out there uh, has drinks alcohol regularly, you can uh, relate to this where when you're young, two or three beers will knock you down, but you kind of build up a tolerance so then you know you need six beers or then you move over to wine or mixed drinks you build a tolerance and it goes up and that's true for pretty much every addiction that's out there including pornography what happened to me is like i said i became an addict probably about 12 years old um I was a very successful uh, business person in my hometown here in Maine. I owned and operated a lifestyle magazine. I created a film festival for Northern New England that was actually getting uh, national recognition. Um, and I was also on my city council, so I was a local politician uh, for a while. So for several years leading up to uh, wh when everything came to a head, things were going well for me. I was very well known in my area. And I was kind of on top of the world, yet I was still hiding these, these addictions. Um, in early 2013, about five years after I started the magazine, I noticed that our revenues were plateauing for the first time. And our expenses were still going up. I'm not a good salesperson. I'm not a good business person. I can run a business when I have too much money, which is what we had the first five years. But when things start getting challenging, I'm not good at it. So I started to notice that this you know, major piece of my life, this cornerstone business was starting to fall apart. And I recognized I only had maybe six or eight months to try to pull things together. So I made a very poor decision in early 2013. I pulled myself off of the bipolar medication that I'd been on for probably about 12 years. Um, I, you know, it, it kept me very even, but I think after 12 years, I romanticized what the mania was like back when I was in my early 20s. I remembered being smarter, more creative, having more energy, being more fun to be around. And for some reason, I told myself that I could save my magazine if I took myself off the pills and tapped into that extra creativity and energy and whatnot that would come from not being hindered by those pills. I looked at those pills almost like a restrictor plate on a race car that held me down and I needed to be free to save this thing. Unfortunately, what happened was that within two or three weeks of the drugs being out of my system, my alcoholism and porn use exploded. Instead of only drinking at a uh, networking event or something work related in the evening and then drinking late at night at my house i was drinking first thing in the morning i was making sure that i had beers with lunch i tried to make sure every meeting was a happy hour meeting i was drinking you know four or five times a day and i was drinking much heavier stuff than i ever had in the past um, i was going through nearly a full bottle of tequila in a day on top of having probably another six to ten pints of beer um, the pornography became the same way. As my life was spinning out of control and I was losing control of my magazine, um, things got worse at home with my family because I was under so much stress and there started to be a little bit of an estrangement there uh, between my wife and my kids and I. Um, and it, I was uh, finishing up on the city council, which was not a good experience for me and caused a lot of stress. Uh, so it was, there was a whole bunch of stuff happening at the same time, which was just making my life worse and worse. Um, I was not getting you know, enough sleep. Like I said, I was off of my meds. Um, and what I started doing was I, star, I, I stopped watching just video clips online and I started going into chat rooms. And these are like one-on-one -on -one chat rooms, not, not the cam rooms that you see now, but these were just regular chat rooms where one person's camera would hook up to another person's camera. And if you liked 
the person you saw, you kept talking to them. If you didn't, you could click next. They could do the same thing with you. And I uh, figured out pretty quickly that nobody was going to stop and talk to a 36-year-old guy who looks even worse than I do now. I, I, I looked haggard and tired and miserable and probably weighed 50 pounds more than I do now. No, no pretty girls were going to stop and talk to me. So I actually uh, figured out a way to bypass my camera and I showed a video that I found of a good looking 23, 24 year old guy who looked like he was just typing away on his computer. And by doing this, I was able to finally get good looking women to stop and talk to me because they thought this was me. And because I have my, my life since I was 18 years old, I've been a journalist or an editor. Um, I've learned how to uh, ask questions and in interviews. I've learned how to get information out of people. You know, I, I can do that thing where it looks like I'm a psychic and I'm, I'm guessing things about you when the reality is you're giving me all kinds of information. You don't realize it. And I was able to do that to the women that I talked to because number one, they didn't see me the way that you and I see each other through Zoom right now. They saw somebody else. So I was able to be on, and we always I always would only talk in typing, so they never heard my voice. I would uh, be on one, I'd be watching them on one side of my screen, and on the other side, as I asked some leading questions, I'd be able to research all kinds of stuff about them, and which they didn't even realize they were giving me information about who they were. And then I tried to groom them to get them to uh, expose themselves or do different sexual things to themselves. And this was kind of my. Uh, feeling of power. This was kind of my way that I exerted control was because I, I didn't want to find, you know, some kind of slutty 25 year old woman who would just, you know, flip her top when I said, you know, show me your boobs. I wanted someone who said they wouldn't do it. And then I wanted to take an hour or two hours and slowly break them down and convince them I was their friend and convince them they should do this. And when I was able to do that, that's when I felt like I had control. That's when I felt like I was capable of accomplishing something. If you would have come into my office at, my, uh, at the magazine, you would have seen a ton of plaques and trophies and certificates on the wall. And they weren't there so you would think I was awesome. They were there so I would think I was awesome because I always needed that reassurance that I was good enough and I should be doing what I was doing. And I had control and I had power. And when all of that started disappearing from my life, this was the only way, and this shows you how twisted my mind was at the time, this was the only way that I knew to exert control and to prove to myself I was capable of doing something. So at the end of a session with one of these women, if I was able to convince her to do whatever I wanted, you know, after an hour, two hours, three hours of talking to her in the middle of the night, I would take a screen capture or two not for some kind of masturbatory material later on, because if I want that, I know how the internet works. Mm -hmm. I took these pictures as a trophy. And this was kind of like the, the certificate on my wall or, or the you know, plaque on my wall saying, I, excuse me, I did something right. This, I had a folder in, on my hard drive, which was just pictures of women who I had convinced to do this horrible stuff online with uh, because I needed to be able to look at something and say, okay, I can accomplish things. I mean, like I said, this is how warped my brain had become at the time because this was really the critical, most critical part of my addiction. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm drunk during most of this as well. Um, so then on uh, March 20th, 2014, uh, I'm sitting at my kitchen table around 9, 9.30 in the morning. I was trying to get some work done before I actually went into the office and two cars pulled up and uh, so did a van to the front of my house. I was the only one that was there. My wife was at work, the kids were at school and it doesn't take somebody who has watched a lot of cop shows from the 80s to know what unmarked cars look like. Yep. Um, and when a bunch of guys wearing golf jackets in March in Maine get out of their car, you know they're police. And uh, so I, I had no idea why they were in my front yard. I thought somebody had died or something, you know, really severe had gone down. So I went and answered the door and I could see the guy in the front. He had a search warrant. 
and he let me know very quickly that they believed that I had engaged with a teenage girl online. So since they have a search warrant, I let them into my house because you have to. And they, in the next five, 10 minutes, laid out the case that at one point in November, 2013, I had talked to a teenage girl online. Um, and, you know, they said, you know, I, I should have known, I should have realized it. I should have realized I was playing with fire. I can't say I, I knew for sure she was. Um, I don't know if it would have, if as long as she didn't look like a kid, uh, that it would have minded in my mind. But I also really stress to people that um, I own this. You know, I did this. This is a horrible thing to do. I know that there are girls who are 15 and 16 who look 25 or 26 and vice versa. I also know that my mind was in a completely warped state, but I take full responsibility for it. I made the decision to pull myself off of my bipolar medication. For you know, nearly 25 years, I was a porn addict and I looked at this stuff and I needed it to help me get through tough times, but I never crossed that line onto what I would flat out say was cheating on my wife by talking to these women online and having intimate moments with them and, you know, convincing them to do sexual things. Okay, so, wait, you know, can you, can you restate that one more time? Yeah. So, you know, being, being with your wife, you, you didn't think that there was a point of infidelity going on, even though you were having this, these moments with these in, girls? In, in looking at porn, I didn't, just looking at porn, I did not think that that was infidelity. Okay. In talking with these women in these chat rooms and convincing them to disrobe or to do sexual things to themselves, to me, that crossed a line into a level of cheating. While it wasn't physically cheating, it was certainly emotionally cheating. Uh, you know, it, it, it's really reprehensible if you're married, in my opinion, to do that. But I was so sick that that didn't register. Cause and effect was not registering. And I can't blame the addiction for that. I can't blame the alcohol for that. I have to blame my poor decision to pull myself off of my bipolar meds. Had I not made that decision, I truly believe that none of this would have happened with any of these women, much less one being underage. I don't think that I would have gone there had I stayed on my medicine as I should have. So uh, I try not to minimize what I did to this teenage girl. I try not to rationalize what I did to this teenage girl. You know, she's somewhere now in her early 20s, and I hope there's no scarring. I hope this wasn't a jarring thing for her. I hope she just went on with her life. Um, you know, that's what I, that's what I really pray. But uh, I, I did this thing. It's a horrible, heinous thing. And that's one of the reasons why I'm out there now sharing my story. Um, you know, I, I've told this story a hundred times, if not more. It's still embarrassing every time. I does still it, does it you know, hate to tell it, but it it, it's an important story. <sighs> Because I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, right? Because, you know, I think all of us have done, um, have made poor decisions in our lives, right? Um, but then there's, there's certain decisions that haunt us, no matter, you know, no matter how we have dealt with them or not. Like, I know I've made decisions in my life that haunt me till today, that when I think about it, I still feel that sense of guilt because I did it. So, you know, I'm asking you, I, does that I do, haunt I, I do feel that, but I feel like I've gotten through a lot of that. There, I will always feel bad for what I did to a girl who didn't ask for it to be done. I also feel bad for all the women because, you know, it doesn't matter whether she's 15, 16, or 25, or 26. It's a really bad thing to do to anybody at any age. Um, so, you know, just because some of these women were in their 20s or 30s doesn't make it any better. So I did this really scuzzy, scummy thing to these women and these females, and that's a, that's a bad feeling that I have this. What actually weighs on me more with the guilt is that from the day I was arrested um, all the way up till I was when I was sentenced, which was two years, my name kept popping up in the newspaper or on TV. I was very well known. When I was arrested and my wife came and bailed me out of jail, we drove back to my house and there was already a TV news van in front of it. I mean, like I said, I was a bit of a local celebrity. So I had to deal with the media, uh, most of whom I knew very well because I'd worked in the media for so long. Uh, I had to deal with the media my entire time from my arrest to my sentencing. And I feel really bad for my kids. 
um, having to deal with that and having to deal with having a father who did this kind of stuff. My dad would never have done anything like this. And I hope to God my kids never do anything like this. Same thing with my wife. She never asked to be married to somebody who had this problem uh, or w was capable of ever doing anything this stupid. Um, they're the ones who I felt the worst for. I felt bad for my mom. I felt bad for my dad. Everybody would tell them all the time how proud they must be of me for being a city councilor and for having this wonderful magazine. And then all of a sudden, all these people wake up one morning and across six columns at the top of the newspaper is former city councilor, you know, uh, arrested on underage pornography charge. You know, that's embarrassing to go from everybody telling you how great your kid is to not mentioning anything at all. Uh, you know, no matter what hardships I had to go through or that I'll go through in my life because of this, uh, what really bothers me and what sticks with me guilt-wise, what sticks with me shame-wise is what I did to other people or the situations I caused for other people that they never asked for. That's the part that's the toughest. Well, um, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot to take in, right? Um, but being that you um, worked uh, at such a high level of your town, right? Um, knowing the people of the media, you know, how did you, how did you dabble with all of this press, you know, being, you know, a, you know, put out there about you in, in such a way that obviously wasn't, you know, shining or making you look right. Um, well, it, it was it was very surreal. I mean, the first two or three days, you can't believe all this attention is about you. Because you can't imagine, you can't believe you were caught up in something like this. This is like something from a bad episode of Dateline, and you're in the middle of it. I remember that first night um, when my kids were home and my wife was home, and a TV news van pulled up around 9 or 10 at night to do a live remote for the 10 o'clock news. And we quickly ran from my living room into my bedroom and shut the door, and we got one of our dogs in the bedroom, but not the other. So we flipped on the TV that was that ha that was the news channel and we could see the front of our house on TV live as the person's reporting and we could see the dog that we forgot in the living room up on the couch looking out the window barking and we could hear it in the house because it's only two rooms away and we could see it on TV the dog's mouth moving and you're just standing there and you're going oh my god God, this is actually really happening. And it doesn't really register because it's so surreal. It's so strange. It's, it's, it's stranger than any movie you've ever seen because you know it's real life. You know it's happening to you. And yeah, you know, over the next few days, the press reported some inaccurate information, but it's not the kind of thing where even though I know people at the newspaper office, I'm not calling them and saying, hey, you know, one of the things they reported was that I couldn't be around anybody under the age of 18 while I was out on bail. And that wasn't true. I could be around my kids. That was in my bail restrictions. But I'm not going to call the newspaper and ask them to print a correction. So there, there was misinformation out there. And as the, the uh, case evolved over two years, um, and as you know, charges were, were dropped or charges were added and the, the police did their due diligence and found out you know, what had really happened what really didn't happen, I don't feel like the news accurately reported that you know, I wasn't some kind of evil pedophile preying on children. This was me who was a porn addict who, you know, really just let things get out of control and make a very stupid mistake. Um, and I know that a lot of people who know me recognize that, but I feel like that was never, uh, I was never shown um, like that in the media, but you can't control it at the time. And eventually you just have to let it go. The day that I learned about letting it go was, um, I went in and uh, pled not guilty. That's, you know, first or second thing you have to do is after your initial appearance, you go in and you plead not guilty. Doesn't matter what you did, doesn't matter what you didn't do. You plead not guilty, that's part of the process. Um, that afternoon, the newspaper on their Facebook site 
uh, mentioned that that had happened. And there was hundreds of people who were saying horrible, horrible things about me. Like, I should go to jail for 99 years. I should get the chair. You know, how many kids have I been molesting all these years when that was not even part of it? And what dawned on me that day was that when I was running my magazine, when I was running my film festival or, or was a politician, there were people who used to say wonderful things about me on Facebook all the time. People I didn't know, people who didn't really have the facts, but I didn't question it because they were all saying such nice things about me. Yet here I'm reading this horrible stuff, most of which isn't true. People are completely uninformed. They're not coming from the same place of logic. And I recognize some of those names are the same people who were saying wonderful things about me just a year or two earlier. And it dawned on me that day that how could I really take any of the nice things that these people said seriously when I can't take any of the bad things they say seriously because they're so woefully uninformed. They don't know anything about me. They don't know anything about this case. Uh, they're just jumping to conclusions because that's what people do on social media, you know, and, and they want to share their opinions. So that was truly the day when I stopped caring what other people thought about what was going on with me. And now you know, now we're talking six, seven years later, there are people that I'll run into in town who I haven't talked to since then. Some people see me, they turn around and go the other way. Some people see me come up, start shaking my hand, tell me that they've heard I've written these books and you know, I've got a TED talk coming up and things are coming together and it's great I turned my life around and they're proud of me. And I accept both responses. Um, uh, you know, I can't control how other people think of me. I don't worry about how other people think of me. I worry about how my core family thinks of me. I worry about how my very closest friends think of me. But as far as everybody else, I don't worry about them nearly as much anymore. Um, and I move forward because that's all you can do. I did this stupid, horrible thing. And for the last several years, I have been trying to make amends by becoming an advocate for education of porn addiction. Now, let, let's talk about your sentencing, right? Um, you said two years, correct? No, I was sentenced to nine months, and I served uh, six months. Six months. Now, you know, uh, I think as a, as a parent, you know, that must have been tough on your kids, right? So how was, how was that part of your kids? It was, well, I mean, I, I had prepared them for it. They knew it was coming. And then when I was actually, I was actually, uh, I pled guilty in May of 2015, but I went to another rehab facility after that. And then the judge granted the ability to do a pre, uh, pre-sentencing disposition, which basically it's almost like having a trial without having one, where several different people, you know, interview me, analyze me, put me through tests, and they give the judge all the evidence, and then the judge bases her decision on that. That didn't happen until January of 2016. So my kids knew for six, seven months I was going to go to jail for some amount of time. We had prepared them for that. Um, I, I think that the, and I went away to rehab twice, um, once for about three months and another for two months. So they were a little bit used to me not being at home for stretches of time. Um, but the thing that sticks with me is that I worry that coming to visit me in jail um, is going to cause them some nightmares or trauma later in life because that that's a pretty heavy thing even despite the fact that you know my daughter at the time was this was now four years ago my daughter at the time was 17 my son at the time was 13 14 so they weren't little kids but uh you know going to visit your dad in jail him wearing the the jail jumpsuit and you know having to talk between the glass uh, i can't imagine what I would have thought about that when I was a kid. So I worry about that with my kids. But I'll tell you, I have, uh, right after I was arrested, I started to get help almost immediately. I went to rehab for alcoholism for about three months. I went to a rehab for porn and sex addiction for two months. I researched the heck out of this as much as I could. I got into some very intense uh, 
therapy one-on-one -on -one and group therapy here in Maine before I was sentenced. The day that I went and got sentenced, I was actually the healthiest version of myself that I'd ever been because I spent all this time bettering myself. The guy who did the time in jail was not the guy who created or who, uh, who broke the law. Yeah, I, I, that, that guy has long been dead. And, you know, I'm happy to say now with my 21-year-old daughter, my 17-year-old son, you know, my wife, my mother and father, I have better relationships, more intimate relationships, deeper, more meaningful relationships with all of them right now than I ever have. Um, I look back and I see, you know, these policemen coming to my door, you know, I kind of felt like they were little devils there to tear my life apart. But in looking back now, and I know this is a little bit cheesy to say, but it's almost like they were angels who delivered me from that life that was not healthy for me, that was not good for me, and have given me another lease on life. And yeah, you know, I'm going to have to wear this scarlet letter my whole life, and you can go online, and the story's always going to be there, but I am such a happier, healthier person who's trying to do some good in this world now for others and not just do good for myself. And I, I just feel so much better that uh, to have to go through all of this to get to where I am now, I think I'd probably do it again um, because I don't think that I would have survived the way that I was going the other way. I don't think I'd be here talking to you now. I think I would have either, you know, been killed in a drunk driving accident or very likely killed myself. Wow. Um, and, you know, before we jump into the, uh, before we jump into the book, right, um, you know, that period of time that you were in jail, right, there's always this, uh, this, I guess, this association that, you know, when people go into jail for uh, being accused of what you were being accused, um, there's, there's not the best treatment in jail for them, right? How was, how was that, how was that experience for that amount of time that you were there? Uh, it really wasn't bad because these guys knew pretty much everything about my case. The day before I had to report to jail, the newspaper did this giant front page story recapping everything that had happened for the last two years, my whole ordeal. And every day, every pod at the jail got a couple copies of the paper. So when I walked into my pod, and my pod was minimum security, uh, my pod was uh, protective custody. So really, these were not the rough and tumble murderer types. Uh, these were guys who wanted to get through their time and get it done and not be harassed and not harass anybody else. There were uh, people in my pod who uh, created or who had done very violent sexual acts on people. Um, that, so they, any scorn that happened would be thrown towards them, but there was very little scorn. And what actually happened was these guys knew what happened to me. I shared the story, got a few, you know, explaining some of the details that the newspaper, you know, didn't really get into. And what was interesting was within a week or two, some of these guys started coming to me and asking me about their porn habits and asking me about their sex habits because they were worried that they were addicts. And in a lot of cases, they were. They had issues around their sexuality. And it was fascinating because they weren't embarrassed talking about their drug use. They weren't embarrassed talking about, you know, slapping their girlfriend around or, or the robbery that they pulled to end up there. They were embarrassed talking about their sex and pornography use, which was exactly the same as the doctors or lawyers or mothers or daughters or any of the professionals who had porn and sex addiction that I met in rehab. These people only but for the grace of God were not that different, um, whether they were a, you know, millionaire doctor or, you know, somebody who was homeless and, and had these issues. So that, that was the point where it really shocked me how embarrassing this was for everybody because everybody thought it was them. You know, I think when you, when you think of a porn addict, most people think of this 19 year old guy who, you know, with pimples who lives in his mom's basement and has never kissed a girl in real life because he's got no game and can't talk to girls. And the, the truth is there is no stereotypical porn addict. I have met every age. I have met both genders, you know, every possible color, religion, you know, where you're from. There is no stereotypical porn addict like there is no stereotypical alcoholic or any stereotypical drug addict. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote my first book, which I wrote in jail 
trial was because I wanted to tell my story basically to demystify the idea there's a stereotypical porn addict because here I was married at that point for about a dozen years, you know, two great kids. I was a white collar business owner, you know, politician, very well known. If there was anybody who was the last person you would think was a porn addict, it was me. But I was a porn addict for 25 years, and I reached a level of sickness where I was capable of doing this stuff right at the very end of my, of my addiction. And I thought that was an important story to tell, because if I can have this happen to me, anybody can. You know, there's probably somebody listening to this podcast right now who's saying, well, yeah, I, I look at too much porn and maybe I have a bit of a porn problem, but I'm not as far along as he was. And you're right. You're not as far along as I was. Those last six, seven months, I never thought I could get there ever. You know, for 99% of my porn addiction, it was just a computer screen or magazines or videotapes. But it got to that really sinister place at the very end. Because like I said, addictions escalate. What's on a page isn't good for me anymore. I need to actually interact with somebody. My, my addiction's you know, demanding so much of me, I have to keep ratcheting it up. And that's how I ended up in those chat rooms, making those horrible mistakes. And if that can happen to me, that can happen to anybody. Now, um, how much, I, I'm sorry, I just, I just got so many questions. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I, um, how much time were you dedicating to this? Dedicating to what? To the chat rooms, to the pornography. Uh, like it was when I, when my, uh, porn addiction was ongoing. It would probably be four or five times a week, usually late at night after everybody had gone to bed an hour to an hour and a half. When I got to that really critical point there in those last six, seven months, it was probably six or seven nights a week. Um, I would start around midnight and then there were some times I didn't finish till four or five in the morning. And I had to be up at seven o'clock to get the kids to school and get everything going. So I was only sleeping two hours a night for months and months at that point. Um, it really had blown apart. And not to mention that, you know, after I got the kids to school, my wife went off to work. A lot of times I came back home and I would just look at normal porn before I went to work, um, which I had never, ever done before. Um, that was not when I looked at that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it really did escalate quickly and, and uh, in, in a very major way. Um, and uh, last but not least, do you think that uh, these people who you were incarcerated with coming to you for these uh, questions and these advice is the reason why you now have written the books that you have written? It's one of the major reasons. Uh, it showed me that it doesn't matter who you are. Almost everybody who has these issues suffer from shame and embarrassment. And we're not going to be able to talk about porn addiction as a society. And it's a pretty big deal right now, especially with the internet, uh, having been there over the last 20 years. Right now, um, men between the ages of 18 and 30, there was a study a few years ago, 32% say that they have a problem with or are addicted to pornography. Now think about that. 32? 32%. That's almost one in three men between 18 and 30 who believe that they have a problem with pornography. So we need to do something about this because this is not healthy sexuality. What happens if when these men become 40 or 50 or 60, what happens if the kids who are coming up now, if they're not taught that pornography can cause some problems, we're going to have a very unhealthy sexual society. Now, we didn't know what the internet was going to do on the first generation that was raised on it. Now we do have some idea what happens to them. Um, and we need, what we need to do is let this next generation know that there are drawbacks to looking at copious amounts of porn on the internet. And, you know, ranging from physical issues to mental issues to, you know, emotional issues that have popped up and, Ultimately, it's, you know, when, when you're a kid, you tell your kids, don't smoke. You know, if you see a cigarette, come let me know. Uh, here's how you cross the street both ways the right way. You know, don't do drugs. And I think that, you know, it's unfortunate. But in 2020, we need to tell our kids, don't look at pornography. That's not for children. If you see it, come let me know. 
and we need to make it age appropriate. We can make it age appropriate for teenagers as well and get a little more graphic, but we need them to know that there is a strong possibility that if they use too much of this, if they start to get an, attach an attachment to it, it can lead to an unhealthy addiction like so many other things can. And I just think that that knowledge, if we can spend one hour every year in high school health classes telling both boys and girls that porn can be dangerous, we're going to see these numbers drop. Now, you know, I never did heroin. I never did meth. Why? Because I was taught that they were really bad for me. I was taught that there was, you know, something that would, they could possibly kill me, that if they didn't kill me, it would still cause trouble in my life. Did anybody ever tell me this about pornography? No, they never told me that, you know, I could have erectile dysfunction for the rest of my life under certain circumstances. They never told me I could end up getting in trouble with the law like I did have happen. They never told me that, you know, it's the kind of thing that causes a huge amount of divorce and a huge amount of betrayal trauma for partners. You know, I never heard any of this. Would it have made a difference if I had been told this at, you know, 10 years old or 12 years old or 14 years old? I don't know, but I think based on the fact that there was a lot of negative behaviors I didn't get involved with, it might have helped. And if we can start doing this with the younger generation, I'm, I'm not anti-porn. I'm not saying people can't watch porn in a way that some people can drink or the way that some people can gamble. I think, you know, everything in moderation, but we need that educational component behind it that says, here's what can possibly happen. Here's the best uh, science or the best knowledge we have right now, take it and move forward and make your decisions. Because right now people have no science, they have no statistics, they don't know what's going on because nobody wants to talk about it. There's shame, there is embarrassment, and we have to be willing to talk about pornography and pornography addiction if we're going to get things back on track as a healthy society. Okay, um, Josh, talk to me about your book, Talk to me. Um, where can we find it? And um, what's your what's the main purpose behind your book? Well, I've I've got three books. There's the very first one that came out, uh, the addiction nobody will talk about. That's the uh, autobiography that I wrote while I was in jail, just going over it. Very funny story, not funny, but ironic. After the book came out, I thought all kinds of addicts would be getting in touch with me. And some did, but I got just as many messages and just as much email from the female partners who wanted to know what to do because I'd successfully navigated it with my wife and they wanted to know what the situation was like because they could go to marriage counseling, but that person had never been an addict. They don't know what happens behind your closed doors. So I wrote my second book, came out last year, which is called He's a Porn Addict, Now What? I wrote this with a therapist. So you get the point of view of a therapist and a former addict. This is a great one for partners. And then my newest book came out in July um, 2020. This is called Porn in the Pandemic, How Three Months Changed uh, in 2020. Because the porn industry got absolutely, the online porn industry got absolutely flipped, turned around in with the pandemic uh, in ways that people had never saw. People have gone to online pornography during the COVID crisis in numbers that they've never seen. I'm one of them. And, 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 you know, and when, you know, when you, when, when you, uh, fill out the form um, to be here, um, you know, that was one of the things that I questioned, right? Because there was a point where I asked myself, I'm like, yo, am I consuming too much porn, right? Um, so, and, and, and I'm asking this question, you know, during this pandemic, um, is it normal for people to be consuming uh, porn at a higher rate? Um, is it, 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 it appears to be what is happening. Now, is that causing more addiction? We don't know yet because it's too early. Now, you know, let's take your case. If you're watching porn more than usual, well, it makes sense. If you're stuck at home, you can't go out with friends. There's nothing to do. If you're somebody who is very social or dates a lot, well, that's even tougher to do than before. You know, we are sexual creatures. Never pretend to not be. Healthy sexuality is one of the greatest things on earth. But you know, when you're stuck in that situation, what outlet do you have? Well, for the absolutely normal person who doesn't have this trauma, porn is a surrogate for sexual activity. You know, it ends with the orgasm just like uh, regular sex does. Um, and 
it is normal to be looking at more of it during this time. Now the question is, let's all the restaurants are starting to open, or I mean, I know depending on where you are and whatnot, but restaurants start to open, your friends start to gather again, life either gets back to normal or becomes whatever the new normal is. Do you find yourself, you know, after a long day at work, wanting to go get that beer with friends that you used to do or wanting to go play basketball or soccer with your friends or do you want to go home and keep looking at porn you know when your friends invite you to do something are you like nah, nah i'm gonna go home and do this you find yourself you know waking up in the morning wanting to look at porn on your phone you know are you starting to spend money on this like you never have before uh you know and for a lot of people for the first time ever they're making porn now um, the, the website OnlyFans, it gained more visitors in the first three months of the pandemic than Pornhub did in almost their first three years of existence. You know, OnlyFans went from being like the 600th most popular website in the U.S. to being something like number 42 in only three months. Be why? Because all of a sudden, all of these restaurant workers, all of these young people who are no longer employed, well, what can they do right now, if, especially if they can't qualify for decent unemployment? Well, they're young, they're good looking, and young people tend to be a little bit more free. These are the young people who have been raised on the internet where you can look at any pornography anytime you want because everybody's got a smartphone in their hand. So a lot of these women and men looked towards things like OnlyFans or cam sites and started making money performing sexually or taking nude photos or whatever because it doesn't have the stigma with this younger generation that it did with older ones. And so for the first time, we're seeing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people making pornography. And a bigger question becomes, what happens to these people in 20 years? We didn't know what would happen to people raised on the internet with unfettered access to porn. Well, now we know it caused trouble with more than we'd ever expected. What happens with these people who are now making porn in 20 years? Where were their heads at then? Are they regretting it? Does it not matter because everybody was doing it? So who cares if there's, you know, pictures of your boobs or your butt or whatever online? It doesn't matter because everybody did it. You know, is there going to be any kind of mental health issue all years later from doing this. We don't know these answers yet, but these are questions we need to be asking now because we've always been very reactive in this country, back to Puritan pilgrim times when it comes to sex. We're very reactive, we're not proactive. Um, Look at the way we're handling the COVID crisis. We are reactive. We're not a proactive country. We're not a proactive society. We react to things and we need to be more proactive with the way that we handle mainstream sexuality, internet sexuality, pornography. We have to start having more open discussions about this because it's a bigger part of anybody's lives than it ever has been. And the pandemic made it even bigger than it ever has been. All right, so um, I got uh, four questions from my followers on Instagram. We've sure. answered some of them, um, but I'm just going to go over them one more time. Mr. Red Bull ha asked, how many hours do you consume, well, did you consume a day? Uh, in normal times, an hour, four or five times a week. When it got to be a really bad uh, addiction, three or, four time, three or four hours a day, six to seven days a week. But I, you know, I urge people to understand that I drank twice that. I was drinking twice as long. Um, it really isn't about the duration. It's about what you're doing during it and the effect it's having on your life. Uh, you know, that, that, that's ultimately what the biggest problem is. Uh, Bianca VB, um, what was the longest you went without watching? I never really tried to stop because I actually did not know pornography was a thing until I got into my first rehab for alcoholism. I thought even being arrested, even, you know, meeting with my lawyer the first time, I thought that the porn addiction was just a reaction, a bad decision that I made when I was drunk. And because I'd been drinking the same time that I'd been addicted to porn. And it took a professional in my first rehab for alcoholism to actually sit me down and say, no, you have a porn addiction and your porn addiction's actually been there longer than your alcoholism. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, I, I don't know if that answers the question exactly, but I didn't even realize it was a porn addiction until 
after I stopped. Um, Functionize says, um, uh, does he have a desire to actually be with another living, breathing girl? Absolutely. I like li to be with my wife. I never stopped liking to be with my wife. At the very end there, when everything in my life was falling apart, I didn't feel like having sex, but I didn't feel like eating. I didn't feel like taking showers. I didn't feel like doing anything at that point. Uh, people need to recognize that a Addiction and the motivations for addiction are not the motivations that you have for regular behavior. Like I mentioned, there's, there's a casino uh, 20 minutes from my house. I go there probably three, four times a year with my wife. We have dinner and then we play slot machines for a little while. I will allow myself to lose $40 and then I'll quit. Or if I get $100 or win $100, I stop and walk away happy. It doesn't really matter to me either way. It's just entertainment and I leave because I don't have that gambling gene. I don't have that little thing that gets me going, but I understand it. I understand how exciting it could be to bet $100 per hand of blackjack, but that's then that stops being exciting. You have to go to 500. You have to go to 1,000. It's like the guy who goes from beer to you know wine to whiskey. You have to keep escalating it. And ultimately... Um, these guys who are gambling addicts, they're not doing it for the money at all. That's, that's not why they're there. They're there for the rush. They're there for the excitement. They're there because this takes them away from their real life. This is fantasy. And that's the way that it was for pornography with me. I didn't, you know, I didn't fantasize about being with other women in real life. I didn't, you know, not want to be with women in real life. Even when I was, you know, in my early 20s before I met my wife, you know, and I was using pornography, I had a very active dating life. I had a very active sex life. They are not mutually exclusive. Um, when you're an addict, I, you know, I wasn't going for the, the orgasm looking at pornography. I'd have an orgasm, but that more told me that everything was over at that point. I was looking for the relief that I felt when I was watching the porn. There were many times in my life, especially towards the end, um, like I said, when I was taking those pictures of the, the screen captures of the women, um, I never masturbated to those pictures. I never looked at them in sexual ways. Um, uh, there were times I would look at pornography online and never be touching myself because I got something from just looking at the pornography. It wasn't about the physical release of an orgasm. It was about so much more that I think only addicts really understand. It's not just about pulling the arm of the slot machine. It's not just about having a beer and being out with friends. It's not just about, you know, getting off, looking at good looking people, having sex. It's a lot deeper when you're an addict. All right, um, Josh, uh, thank you very much for being here. Um, where, where, where can we find you? Where can we reach out if we have any questions for you? Yeah, um, all my social media, buying my books. I also write articles almost every, uh, two or three articles almost every week. I've got a lot of resources in case you think you have some issues. Visit my website, recoveringpornaddict.com. That'll help you out. That's how you can get in touch with me. Anything else you need uh, regarding uh, pornography and pornography addiction, you know, I'm, I'm there to help if you need it. Plenty of resources, like I said, recoveringpornaddict.com. Um, Josh, thank you very much for being here. I was good to a party.